Okay, Ben, are you ready? I am ready. Wonderful. Okay. Um, thank you everyone for joining us for today's research seminar. My name is Cinnamon Moffat and I am the research um, program manager at Hatfield Marine Science Center in Newport, Oregon. I will be your host for today. We uh, have a couple logistics to talk about. Um, your mics, cameras, and screen share have been turned off. And if you can help us by keeping it that way, that would be great. We do encourage you to interact with us using the chat box to ask any questions. Feel free to put them in any time, but we'll probably answer them at the end. I wanted to also let everyone know that we are recording today's session. So if you would like to share it with your friends um, and colleagues after the event is done, it'll be up probably Okay, Ben, are you ready? I am ready. Wonderful. Okay. Um, thank you everyone for joining us for today's research seminar. My name is Cinnamon Moffat and I am the research um, program manager at Hatfield Marine Science Center in Newport, Oregon. I will be your host for today. We uh, have a couple logistics to talk about. Um, your mics, cameras, and screen share have been turned off. And if you can help us by keeping it that way, that would be great. We do encourage you to interact with us using the chat box to ask any questions. Feel free to put them in any time, but we'll probably answer them at the end. I wanted to also let everyone know that we are recording today's session. So if you would like to share it with your friends um, and colleagues after the event is done, it'll be up probably in two days or so um, on HMSC's website under the past seminars page. Um, I wanted to make a couple of announcements before we get started as well. Next week's seminar on June 25th will be Rebecca Mosto. She will be talking about the unlikely hybridization of two non-native beach grasses. I know many of us haven't been on the HMSC campus lately, but her project is set up between housing and the new building and will be there for about a year. So it'll be really interesting to hear what she's doing with that work. Um, that same night on June 25th, we will also have another virtual science on tap with Angie Dewar. She is the marine fisheries specialist with Oregon Sea Grant. She will be talking about Oregon's fishing fleets um, here in Newport. So come and learn a little bit more about the different fish that are being um, harvested right here off our local docks. That event on the 25th will start at six. If you need more information about these or any of our upcoming events, you can log on to the HMSC website. And on our homepage, if you scroll to the bottom, there's a calendar event with a whole bunch more information about each of these different events, including the links you will need to get onto them. But for today, uh, we have two amazing speakers and I'm really excited to have join us. Um, and so I just wanna do a quick introduction. I also just wanna recognize for all of you that have logged in, that might be NOAA folks. Thank you so much for figuring out how to join us via Zoom. Uh, technology platforms are not universal and not everybody can use everything, but I thank you for finding a way to join us. Um, but let me introduce our two speakers. Uh, so first we have Mary. Uh, Mary Hinsicker is a research ecologist with NOAA at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center here in Newport. She has a master's from um, Stony Brook University in marine and environmental science. Her PhD is in aquatic and fisheries science from the University of Washington. And she's been here with NOAA, I think about five years or so. Um, our second speaker, who will actually be our first speaker today, um, is Ben Laurel. Ben is a research fisheries biologist with NOAA's Alaska Fisheries Science Center, but based here in Newport. He is part of the Fisheries Behavioral Ecology Program, which conducts research on the behavioral responses of commercially important marine fishers, meaning fisheries. Um, and his specialty is early survival of cold water commercial fish species. So they're going to talk a little bit about some of the work that they've done in collaboration today. And I am going to drop off and hand it off to you, Ben, if you are ready. Great. Well, thank you, Cinnamon. Yeah, so um, this, is, this is a real collaborative effort. And I just want to um, um, really emphasize Mary Hunsick really did a lot of the heavy lifting for this work. And it's a, it's a project that's been going on actually for 15 years. It's taken different shapes and forms. And I think we finally, now that we have a um, pretty close to a final draft of the manuscript are ready to sort of reveal the story. 
And so I'm going to start out and sort of give an introduction to the species and sort of the questions that we're trying to address. And then about 10 minutes in, um, Mary will take over and show some of the, um, the cool analyses that she's doing, blending um, really a combination of field data, um, remote sensing data, um, um, complex statistical approaches, and um, nice lab data. So it's a, it's a nice study, and I, I hope, um, hope to generate some interest from everybody listening. So I'm going to focus on Pacific cod today. Now, cod fisheries have been really sort of uh, really in the limelight with uh, climate change and changes in commercial fishery stocks, um, especially in the Atlantic. Um, Atlantic cod have undergone some um, very stressful changes in redistributions and abundance changes. And we've heard a lot about those in some large journals and some pretty big impact um, studies. And now, unfortunately, we're having to tell that same story with Pacific cod in, in Alaska. So for the past five years, uh, this stock in the Gulf has particularly gone under severe stress, um, resulting from the recent warm blob uh, in 2014 through 16. There's been over a 78% decline in adult biomass. Um, and coupled with that, we've seen uh, a lot of other changes that I'll get to. But in 2019, it was decided that the fishery would actually close. Um, and this is a pretty big deal because this is the second most important brown fish fishery in Alaska. And as we know, a lot of our fisheries are based out of Alaska. So coupled with these changes in abundance, there's been huge distributional shifts as well. And these haven't been just isolated to the Gulf um, in the bearing here, which is a wide shelf system, uh, recent evidence has shown that Pacific cod are making poleward shifts as a loss of the cold pool, which is an area of cold water that resides in the summer resulting from the ice melt. And then also in the Gulf, in addition to changes in abundance, there's been a deep water shift to more of the shelf edge areas and deeper areas of, of that region. And then finally, there's been bioenergetic stress in these adults and late juvenile stages, um, loss of productivity, lower trophic transfer efficiencies, and the high metabolic demands brought about by hot water in the system has really shown evidence of lots of skinny fish. And this is just another, um, another example of, of stress um, from changes in their thermal habitat and how this might impact uh, the population. So these stories have all been sort of released at once and we've really been um, struggling to understand uh, the life history of this animal and the processes affecting them. Um, but just we're playing kind of catch up with what's going on with the earlier life stages. And you know, they, these early life stages are actually more sensitive and more attuned to their environment arguably than these later life stages. And yet this is where we kind of have this uh, knowledge gap currently from our monitoring programs in Alaska. Um, as well as some of the biology just to, to understand these relationships with the environment. So I would say in uh, the last three years, there's been a huge uh, investment from the you know, Alaska Fisheries Science Center to understand processes, what's governing um, stress in the first year of life, and also to really incorporate some of these metrics that we can develop from early life history stages and incorporate them into management and sort of really understand when recruitment is set um, can we get a sense of strong or weak uh, cohorts and what they might mean to the fishery? And then overall develop a better recruitment paradigm for Pacific cod and sort of prepare for alternative management strategies as we see you know, promise or kind of gloom in, in the future recruitment success of the species and the population in the region. So <clears throat> studying early life history processes in Pacific cod is kind of complicated by a uh, uh, complex life history. Well, it's a unique life history, I should say. It's gadids generally have pelagic eggs and they have multiple batches that they release over the course of the season, usually in the spring. And so you have this protracted spawning and lots of larvae that are kind of ubiquitous in the system. Um, in the case of Pacific cod, they're a uh, demersal egg, so they're adhered to the bottom and they are released as a single batch. And so we have this really narrow spawning window, which we think is going to be really important. And, and some of the things that Miss Mary is going to talk about shortly. Once the eggs hatch, the larvae float up to the surface and they feed with uh, copepod and nucleae. And then they have to be infected into the near shore where they um, carry out the first two to three months in very shallow water and 
to warmer, they have a prey switch before presumably moving to deeper water. And throughout this life history, we can see that there's all sorts of potential different thermal masses the animals can encounter, and there's potential um, different mechanisms might, that might can govern their survival success. And there's been two recent um, studies that we've conducted that have focused in on two of the life stages. The first is the egg stage, and the second is that juvenile stage when they get to the nurseries. And these are um, focused on what these thermal impacts are having, what are the um, effects of the warm blob um, on their survival success. And they have two contrasting stories. So when we look at the uh, egg stage for Pacific cod, we know that they have a very narrow thermal window. They actually have a, a much more narrow thermal window for survival than other gadids. And through some modeling exercises and comparing that with survival output estimates, we find that there's strong links with, uh, with temperature and bottom uh, during the winter, spring, offshore bottom temperatures and uh, recruitment success. And we find this, uh, it's, it's a, um, an effect that we're now looking at also extending and looking at the Bering Sea. In contrast, when we look in um, the nursery areas, these, even though these thermal habitats are much warmer, they're not having direct impacts on the growth potential of the juveniles in the system. And this graph just shows three red lines corresponding with the warm blob years. And if you look through July through September, this is the sort of growth potential in you know, a mix of cold, uh, medium, and warm years. And there really is not a significant direct impact. Of course, there's all these indirect effects of, of, of bioenergetic um, demands that are changing, but it's very contrast to what we know with um, eggs. So the last challenge is what, what about this larval stage? And of course, it's always saving the hardest for last because there's a lot more complicated dynamics at play and oceanographic processes that we have to deal with. And so to address these questions, we've couched them under uh, match-mismatch theory, which is uh, a real core um, um, aspect of fisheries ecology in the sense that the timing of prey production in the system and when larvae have to first feed can be a real important uh, bottleneck in uh, recruitment dynamics in marine fish populations. And it's established theory and it's one that's actually gaining higher attention now with climate change. And that's because um, as climate changes, these changes in the phenology, both the animals and their prey are potentially getting um, more and more decoupled, leading to more greater chances of mismatch. So just to remind you in this upper left panel here, the match mismatch theory is that these spring spawners um, that are releasing their eggs are fixed whereas the prey production brought upon by the first phytoplankton blooms and secondary production is variable in time and its onset is determined by um, a lot of the uh, thermal conditions in the water that um, get things going. And as we get into warmer water, these prey production, um, uh, the productivity in the system is going to earlier and earlier phases and uh, whereas the spawning times of these animals remain constant. And this is applied to multiple taxa and it's been looked at across different systems in different regions. And it's something that is really a concern for um, a lot of fisheries managers because we see these changes operate, happening almost in real time. The second part <clears throat> and part of this that we factored into uh, this modeling exercise that we'll talk about are the increased energetic demands of fish. So we have changes in the system, but we also have changes in the energetic demands of the fish. And the idea here, is that as the system warms up, um, the yolk reserves that these animals have are going to um, be shortened. They have um, just purely by um, energetic, um, or the catabolism of the animal, they're gonna catabolize the yolk faster. And if we can actually parameterize that rate, we can uh, combine both oceanography and these vital rates um, into ways to sort of make predictive uh, models of habitat, which we'll get to. So I, I, since I'm a lab guy and I focus most of my work these days on uh, measuring these types of things in the laboratory, I'm going to bring, it really does put Hatfield Marine Science Center on the map and sort of why we're, we're doing this work and what, um, at Hatfield is because we have a lot of these uh, important ground fish species here on hand. We have broodstock populations for Pacific cod as well as a lot of the other ground fish species in Alaska. And um, we do this type of work where we have temperature control and actually can, can measure these things in a laboratory. 
Um, just to describe the experiments that were uh, driving the model, again, the question here is how temperature is determining how long these larvae can survive in the absence of food before they have to start first feeding. Um, this was an experiment that was conducted a while ago, actually, when we brought in wild eggs from the field. And um, the, the experimental design is relatively simple, but it actually it becomes pretty involved because it's really meticulously keeping track of multiple batches of eggs um, and all these different incubation trays and measuring uh, daily mortality rates and um, doing this over quite long periods of time because we're looking across uh, temperatures from zero degrees, in this case, up to eight degrees. So the basis of design here is that we have five temperature treatments that are replicated. Uh, we're interested in knowing that once the larvae hatch, out of each tray. Um, if they're early in the hatch cycle or later in the hatch cycle at that temperature, how long they can survive in the absence of food. Remembering that fish larvae don't all hatch on the same day, even if they're from the same, that they're all siblings and they're in the same temperature treatment as protracted. We know that early hatchers tend to have larger yolks and later hatchers have later yolk, or sorry, early hatchers have larger yolks and later hatchers have smaller yolks. So we wanted to characterize not only the effect of temperature, but the effect of where you hatch in the hatch cycle. So once they hatch, they're transferred to another container, and we monitor those over a period of a month and a half, um, in the case of the cold water treatments, and then by having these types of data, we can fit these nonlinear functions to survival as a function of temperature and hatch uh, timing in this hatch cycle. And just, that was a lot of words to describe a visual here, which I think captures all of it. Um, so these are Pacific cod larvae. They're about four and a half millimeters at hatch. Um, these are temperatures from cold to warm, starting from top to bottom. These are all the same age and after, after hatch. So days post hatch is three days old. And you can clearly see, of course, the colder fish are maintaining larger yolks than these uh, um, warmer um, treatment fish are the same age. And then once you track these over time, if you go over to these panels corresponding with each temperature, you can see that um, the percent survival shown in the y-axis with days post-hatch on the x-axis, as you go, um, basically you have 100% survival in the absence of food up till around day 30, and you get these precipitous declines at zero degrees. In contrast, a larvae at eight degrees has about seven to eight days before we see these declines. And each curve corresponds to where they are in that hatch cycle. So the can't really see it that well, but these early hatchers that are dying earlier at zero degrees are the larvae that hatched late in the hatch cycle. So they're born with smaller yolks. So I'll stop there. This is just um, some of the lab uh, vital rates that go on and will be used in the models that uh, Mary will describe. So I'm gonna hand it off over to her now and she'll pick up and sort of put all of this into the bigger picture. Are you there, Mary? Yes, I'm here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm trying to share my screen with a little bit of a lag. Did you want me to share the screen and then you talk or do you, I can do it either way. Well, let me see if it, I'm trying to try a couple more times and see if I can get it to work. Hmm. Okay, I guess you'll have to share it. Okay. 
Okay, so Ben, <laughs> can you hear me? I can hear you, yep. Is that good? Okay. Yes, so you're going to advance the slides? One more. Okay. No, go back. Okay. Okay. No. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, it worked when we tested it, but it's not working now. Um, all right. Well, thanks, Ben. Um, and as Ben mentioned, for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to tell you about our work that essentially scales up of the experimental work done by Ben and his colleagues. And for this project, our goal has been to develop a mechanis mechanistic model to a, a model using their temperature dependent rate functions to see how match mismatch dynamics for Pacific cod are changing both spatially and temporally in the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea. You can advance. And um, as Ben alluded to, the motivation for this work has been to help inform ecosystem-based fisheries management in Alaska ecosystems. The information on the potential mechanisms affecting the survival of early life stages can provide valuable context for management decisions in these systems. And this information is especially important for managing marine resources in the face of current and future changes in climate and ocean conditions. And it also addresses one of the main objectives in NOAA's um, national and regional climate science strategies, which is to understand uh, the mechanisms of climate impacts on living, re living marine resources. Next slide. And there are um, three uh, specific objectives of our study. The first is to predict the habitat quality of first feeding Pacific cod larvae in the Southeast Bering Sea and the Gulf of Alaska across time and space from 1998 to 2019. And we're defining first feeding cod larvae as less than one month old and greater than 4.5 and less than seven millimeters in standard length. And the second objective is to evaluate how match mismatch dynamics impacted survival potential of larval cod. And then the third objective is to evaluate whether the processes affecting larval survival potential varied between the Gulf and the uh, Bering Sea. Next slide. We may expect that these processes will vary between the systems because their physical environments are quite different. For example, the Gulf of Alaska has a narrow shelf with canyons and troughs inter interdispersed through the region. And there are several small islands in this region. The, set, the shelf in the Gulf stays ice-free over the winter, except for in some shallow areas inside bays and fjords. In contrast, the Bering Sea has a very wide and relatively shallow shelf region and historically has been dominated by ice in the winters. However, in recent uh, winters, this region has largely remained ice-free. Next slide. And as Ben mentioned, to accomplish our project objectives, we pulled together multiple sources of information. This included laboratory experiments um, from Ben and his colleagues, uh, ichthyoplankton data from the Gulf of Alaska and Bering Sea surveys, as well as, as, well as satellite remote sensing data. And we used uh, the model derived um, from the experimental study that Ben described earlier to predict survival potential of larval cod in the two regions using field estimates of larval co cod phenology based on the ichthyoplankton surveys and temperature and food conditions based on the satellite um, sea surface temperature and chlorophyll data. Next slide. So just briefly, as Ben mentioned, we use a uh, nonlinear model, specifically a generalized additive model to describe the survival of the newly hatched cod larvae in the absence of food as a function of temperature and hatch time. And the model explained about 93% of the survival variance and the mild model diagnostics were robust. And so we felt pretty good about applying this model to ocean observations to predict the survival of first feeding cod larvae in the Gulf and the Bering Sea. Next slide. Um, to identify the location of the first feeding uh, larval cod uh, and to define the focal areas for the predictions of habitat quality, we use samples from the Alaska Fishery Science Center's ecosystems and Fisheries Oceanography Coordinated Investigations Program, also known as ECOFOCI. This program has been sampling in the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea region since 1979. In the Gulf, the first feeding cod larvae were found throughout the region um, with high densities north and east of Kodiak Island and high densities were also found from the Shumigan Islands to Unimak Pass. And in the Bering Sea, first feeding cod larvae were found in high densities in the Unimak region they were also found around the Pribilof Islands and along the shelf edge of the Bering Sea, but at lower density. And these dashed lines here show the focal areas um, for our predictions of habitat quality um, that I'll be showing um, 
in, in a few minutes. Um, but I also, I want to mention that the ichthyoplankton sampling in the Bering Sea is very limited and more inconsistent compared to that in the Gulf. And therefore, uh, the patterns that we're going to be showing in, the, in our study for the Bering Sea um, are going to be less accurate, accurate than those for the Gulf of Alaska. Next slide. The survey data was also used to identify the average phenology of first feeding larval cod. Again, we use generalized additive models to model first feeding cod larval abundance as a function of latitude and longitude, water depth, day of year, and time of day to develop an integrated average across all the years in our study. The day of year effect is important because it defines the production phenology. And we did find that the day of year had a significant effect on first feeding larval abundance, which indicates the existence of strong seasonality in cod larval production. And peak larval production in the Bering Sea occurred around May 12th, and in the Gulf of Alaska, it occurred around May 17th. Or sorry, yes, May 17th. Um, an important assumption of our analyses is that uh, larval cod has uniform phenology throughout the two regions. However, the shapes and the curves uh, shown here, for example, they show minor peaks, other peaks than the, than the main peak. Um, these minor peaks could be indicative that there are different subunits of the cod stocks that, ha that have their own unique phenology. Um, and also in environmental conditions can also um, change uh, spawn and hatching timing between the years. Next slide. So to characterize food conditions and temperature conditions across space and time in the areas where first feeding larvae were, were observed in the Gulf of Alaska and Bering Sea, we use the satellite remote sensing data. And specifically, we use remote sensing data spanning the sea whiffs and MODIS satellite eras. Next slide. And um, the spatial resolution of the chlorophyll data was approximately nine kilometers, and the temporal resolution used in this study were eight-day averages. Chlorophyll uh, provides a first-order index of phytoplankton uh, biomass and net primary production, and we are using it as a proxy for primary production or, or food condition. However, I do want to mention that card, cod larvae do not actually eat phytoplankton. They eat prey such as copepod nuclei that are at trophic level above phytoplankton. And we do account for a lag in the timing of prey availability for a larval cod in our predictions of habitat quality, and I'll describe this in a few minutes. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, back. <laughs> um, thanks, thanks, Ben. S satellite sea surface temperature data were fit to a lowest function and interpolated over the same grid as the chlorophyll data. And um, we limited our analysis of chlorophyll and sea surface temperature data from March 1st to July 27th. Uh, this period captures the rise and fall of both the spring phytoplankton bloom and uh, peaks of first feeding larval production. Next slide. So once we had the satellite data in order, we used the chlorophyll data to characterize the spatial and temporal surface expression of phytoplankton blooms in the Gulf and the Bering Sea. First, for each year um, and within the Gulf and the Bering Sea where cod larvae were present in the ichthyoplankton surveys, we constructed a time series of chlorophyll spanning March 1st to July 27th uh, with eight day time steps corresponding to those of the remote sensing observations. Then we fed a regression spline to the yearly chlorophyll um, time series. And these figures here show examples of the chlorophyll time series um, for the Bering Sea and Gulf of Alaska from 2016 where the circles are the chlorophyll data and the lines are the modeled, model predicted chlorophyll values. Next slide. So using these uh, yearly time series, we then define the start of the surface expression of the phytoplankton bloom as the day of year at which the predicted chlorophyll concentration re reached one third of the yearly predicted or maximum chlorophyll value. Um, so the, the peak here is that these, the max chlorophyll predicted value and then the one third of the yearly predicted value is shown here in this dotted line down here. So when our um, model, our curve here crosses that dotted line, it's an indication that's the start of the start of the bloom. And we defined the end of the bloom as the day of year at which the predicted con chlorophyll concentration reached one half of the yearly peak shown by the dashed line right here. And um, the duration of the bloom was determined from the number of days between the start and the end of the surface expression of the bloom. For both the Gulf and the Bering Sea, the estimated start of the bloom was always preceded by the uh, peak chlorophyll um, concentration value. And these values remained relatively elevated. 
and sometimes they remained above the one-third threshold throughout the summer. Um, and so we define the end of the bloom at one half rather than one third of the, the highest yearly predicted chlorophyll value. Next slide. So the final step of our analysis was to predict survival potential and develop an index of larval cod habitat quality for each spatial unit of the chlorophyll satellite data in the Gulf and Bering Sea. We derived the index uh, from the experimentally derived relationships between larval cod survival and days without food and water temperature. Uh, the intervening sea surface temperature and the days of mismatch between first feeding cod production and onset of the surface expression of the phytoplankton bloom. And it's here where we added seven days to the predicted onset of the bloom to account for the lag between production of phytoplankton and zooplankton which are consumed by larval cod. And then um, cod habitat quality was uh, expressed as the percentage of cod larvae that survived from hatching to the encounter with food. Uh, I just want to mention that these estimates don't incorporate any field data of larval uh, densities. They're really an estimate of, of the potential for larval survival. Next slide. So here I'm going to walk through an example of what I just described. Uh, this figure here shows the number of days of mismatch between first feeding cod production and the onset of the uh, surface expression of the phytoplankton bloom, which ranges from 70 days shown in red to zero days shown in blue. Next slide. And this next figure is showing the average sea surface temperature during the days that the larvae remained without food. So red indicates warmer temperatures and blue indicates cooler temperatures. Next slide. And then this last figure is essentially showing a landscape of, of survival potential of larval cod. Um, the colors represent the percentage of cod larvae that survive from hatching to encounter with food, where warm colors indicate high potential for survival and cool colors indicate low potential for survival. And this row of figures here shows results for 2007, which was a relatively cold year. And we see that the survival potential is um, high throughout most of the Bering Sea, and it's high in the Gulf of Alaska, and particularly in the central and western regions of the Gulf of Alaska. Next slide. The, the new figures on the bottom of the slide um, here show that the result, sorry, results for 2016, which was one of the years in which the marine heat wave occurred. And what we see is that survival potential is very low throughout the, the Gulf, particularly in the northeastern regions, which are the warmest regions in the Gulf. But overall, this indicates that there was a significant loss of larval habitat in this system during, um, during the heat wave. And figures like these from other warm years show a similar pattern, suggesting that in the Gulf of Alaska, the outcome of mismatch is sensitive to changes in water temperature, which has been mentioned uh, affects the meta metabolic demand of cod larvae and their um, yolk sac reserves after hatching. Now by comparing plots across all years, which I can't really do through this in this presentation, we also found that fluctuations in larval habitats in the Gulf have mostly been driven by variability in the central and the eastern regions of the system, while habitat quality in the western regions remained relatively high. However, in recent warm years, we're now finding fluctuations across the entire Gulf from east to west. Now, in contrast to the Gulf, the Bering Sea continued to remain relatively suitable for larval survival in recent warm years, uh, with some areas of low survival potential along the intermittent shelf um, in these warm years. Um, but in addition, closer inspection Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry. Um, but um, in the Gulf, so I'll, I'll go back. In, in, the, in the Bering Sea, it continued to remain, it was warm uh, throughout the, uh, the ha habitat was still suitable uh, through the warm years and there were some areas of low potential um, along the intermittent shelf in these years. But when we looked at uh, uh, um, plots like these for across all the years in our study, uh, we found that the spatial predictions of habitat in the Bering Sea um, seem to be more related to patterns in the bloom phenology with areas uh, that are characterized by early peaks in chlorophyll um, concentration being more favorable to cod survival, to larval cod survival. Next slide, please. So then we, we condensed the spatial predictions of the survival potential into a single metric in effort to construct a yearly index of cod habitat quality, 
which is defined as the um, percentage of total available habitat in which survival was equal or greater, greater than 40%. And this value is somewhat arbitrary, um, but whichever threshold we would choose um, would have little, little difference on the interannual comparisons because on a relative scale, the habitat quality would increase or decrease by a similar amount across the years. So what we see from these figures um, is that the, the habitat quality is considerably higher in the Bering Sea than in the Gulf of Alaska. The figure on the left shows that cod habitat quality in the Bering Sea has remained relatively high through the warming, recent warming event and only experienced slight shifts downward between 2009 and 12. In contrast, in the Gulf of Alaska, um, larval habitat again appears to be much more sensitive to temperature as we see that the poorest habitat quality occurred during the two warm periods in this time series. Uh, from 1998 to 2005 and from 2014 to 2019. And the highest habitat quality occurred during the cool period between 2006 and 13. In addition, we also found that there's a significant inverse relationship between um, this predicted habitat qual quality index in the Gulf of Alaska and average sea surface temperatures in the two weeks preceding the um, surface expression of the phytoplankton bloom. Um, and we didn't find any relationship between sea surface temperature and the predicted habitat quality index in the Bering Sea. Next slide. To compare uh, cod habitat quality within the, the two systems, uh, we quantified the mean estimated habitat quality and defined uh, sub areas. So this figure shows the mean survival in Gulf of Alaska uh, for west, western, central, and eastern regions shown in purple, blue, and green respectively. And we see that the western regions of the Gulf of Alaska have historically been higher in habitat quality and that there's been an overall decline in all subregions um, in the recent, recent years, the warming years. Next slide. This next figure shows mean survival in Bering Sea for areas north and south of 55 degrees north, which are shown in purple and green respectively. And the trends indicate that habitat quality is higher north of 55 degrees north compared to the southern part of the Bering Sea region, especially in the more recent warm years. And again, we see an overall decline in habitat quality in recent years, and this is more pronounced in the southern part of the, the Bering Sea region. Next slide. Now, there are also some interesting differences in the time series of the average estimates of chlorophyll concentration estimates between the Gulf and the Bering shown by these figures. For example, in the Gulf, the chlorophyll concentrations have been less variable than in the Bering Sea, which is likely a result of large regions of the Bering Sea still being covered by ice during the, in the springtime. However, in both systems, we detected a significant shift in early increases in the chlorophyll concentrations or the start of the bloom um, following the recent warm years. We did not detect any differences in the duration or magnitude of the bloom. Uh, the duration typically ranged from about 20 days to um, 80 days. Um, in, the, um, in the Gulf and up to 100 days in the Bering Sea. And the bloom magnitude in the Gulf and, and the Bering Sea ranged from about two milligrams per cubic meter to about 7.5 uh, milligrams per cubic meter. And finally, the average sea surface temperature in the Gulf of Alaska was from about 1.5 to three degrees warmer in the Bering Sea um, than in the Bering Sea. And in terms of average sea surface temperature, 2016 was the warmest year in the two systems where cod larvae were, were observed during the ichthyoplankton surveys. Next slide. Another interesting result um, is that the Eastern Bering Sea larval cod may be more vulnerable to temporal mismatch than larval cod in the, in the Gulf of Alaska. In these figures, the dashed line on the lower part of the figures show the time series of the start of the bloom in Julian Day and the dotted lines on the top um, part of the figure show the time series of the end of the bloom in Julian Day. And the horizontal dash lines indicate the day of peak larval production in the, in the two systems. So May 12th in the Bering Sea and May 17th in the Gulf of Alaska. And what we see from these two figures is that the peak larval production in the Gulf of Alaska um, has always occurred between the start and the end of the surface expression of the phytoplankton bloom. But in the Bering Sea, the, the peak of larval production has been closer in time to the start of the bloom. And in some years, we can see that the surface expression of, this, uh, the, of the bloom was just beginning during the larval peak abundance. And this result suggests that cod could be more vulnerable to temporal mismatch um, than the Gulf of Alaska cod if the start of the bloom in the Bering Sea um, occurs later in the year, or if the spawning phenology of, of cod shifts to earlier times in the spring as um, temperatures continue to warm. 
Next slide. Lastly, trying to use the Habitat Quality Index to predict the recruitment dynamics of Pacific Cod was not the point of this project. However, we did find some evidence of, of correlation between larval cod, uh, sorry, the larval cod habitat quality um, in the Gulf of Alaska and estimates of recruit per spawner um, from the most current stock assessment report. We acknowledge that there are multiple processes affecting recruitment and so we did not expect to find a strong relationship here, but it was nice to see that there is some correlation between the two. And we did not find any correlation at all between larval cod habitat quality and estimates of recruit, uh, recruits for spawner in the Bering Sea. So in summary, our study demonstrates that there was a significant loss of larval habitat in the Gulf of Alaska during the heat wave, while there were areas of suitable habitat in the Bering Sea um, during this warming, the warming event. Also, the impacts of warming on lar lar larval cod are spatially dependent. For example, survival potential, potential for the fe first feeding larvae uh, was lower in the eastern Gulf uh, compared to um, the, the western regions. Um, in addition, our findings suggest that the outcome of mismatch between cod larvae and their food is different between the Gulf of Alaska and Bering Sea. In the Gulf, the outcome of mismatch uh, is sensitive to changes of water temperature, again, which affects the metabolic demand of cod larvae and therefore the, the duration of their nutritional reserves after they hatch. Mary, you've lost your mic again. Okay, here I am. Can you hear me? Yep, sounds good. Okay. okay, and in the, the Bering Sea, the outcome of mismatch appears to be sensitive to a longer time separation between uh, the chlorophyll concentration and, and the larval production. Okay, next slide. So um, in conclusion, just to put some of our, our results into the broader context of, of some of the um, work um, that Ben was mentioning uh, at the beginning of the talk, um, our study suggests that the low habitat suitability for larval cod during um, extreme warming events may contribute to, to poor recruitment in this region. And while the timing of primary production um, in the Bering Sea may be less matched to first feeding Pacific cod larvae, the consequences of match, mismatch dynamics are being exacerbated in the Gulf of Alaska by way of warm anomalies on top of uh, warmer regional baseline conditions. And uh, the narrowing or shifts in Pacific cod spawning activity will be an important area of future research, as will biophysical transport models that place larvae outside the key evective pathway, pathways for transport to high quality um, larval juvenile habitats. And the direct indirect effects of temperature on both egg and larval survival, coupled with apparent loss of both adults and pre-recruits in the Gulf of Alaska, is strong evidence that spawning output by Pacific cod will be significantly reduced with continued regional warning, warming. And in regard to future research, I just uh, wanted to mention that this project has, has been a really good collaboration across uh, multiple nymph centers and OSU where, where we've leveraged the existing ex expertise of these, uh, these institutions and the, the folks at these institutions. And one of the benefits for me in working on this paper has been to help develop a study framework for, for the Alaska systems that we can try to apply to the California current ecosystems. For example, there's interest at the Northwest Center to get a better understanding of processes affecting the survival of fish early life stages and the relate, their relationship to recruitment, to the recruitment of commercially important fishes such as Pacific hake, sablefish, and petrali sole. And this study also pulled together information from lab studies, field data, and remote sensing data to address the project goals, which I, which I think is fairly, re, fairly unique. Um, and also I think NOAA's push for new technologies such as gliders and sail drones to collect information on ocean systems will also help further inform our understanding of how environmental conditions impact early life stages and other life stages as well. Especially if we, especially, especially, especially if we can couple this information with experimental studies and biological sampling so we can construct mechanistic models which allow us to develop hypotheses and in turn identify research gaps and, and where to uh, focus uh, future research efforts. Um, and with that, I will just ask Ben if he has anything he wants to add um, to what I had presented. Um, and if not, then we can go ahead and um, address any questions that uh, folks might have. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mary. I encourage anybody that has questions to go ahead and type them into the chat box so that we can get to them. Ben, do you want to join us again? Yeah, well, I'm here. Do you want me to okay. join the video? Yeah, why don't you join Bye. the video if possible? And Mary, if you can stay on the mic, that would be great. Um, I just want to thank you both. That just seems like a ginormous <laughs> uh, project uh, with so many collaborators and so many pieces. And so um, it just speaks to the amount of work that you guys have, have put into this and uh, your teams have put into it. Uh, ben, do you have anything you want to add to wrap up your thoughts? Oh, no, just, yeah, it is an example. I think it is, it's, this is kind of the first reveal of this story. Um, and, you know, there's so many, um, there's a lot of, I call it nuggets or whatever you want to say that you can really drill into and explore further. And so it, it is a hard, um, you know, story to put together. And it, it seems like it's really now, you know, we're getting more comfortable talking about it with this paper. So, I mean, but again, I, that's why I'm hoping to get some, get some feedback from some, um, people as we kind of uh, start to expand this and present this to especially you know like the Alaska Fishery Science Center at some of the venues that we have there and then um, same with uh, Mary and her venues and things so anyway just want to echo a lot of those thoughts it's a it's a big project and it's um, look, look forward to get some feedback great um, I'm not seeing any questions on my side oh here they come <laughs> um, let's see Give me just a second, we'll start. Um, ben, are you watching the chats as well? Yes. So we got a question from Jessica. Okay. Let's see. From my understanding of the surveys, the timing of which was designed for pollock larvae is that the surveys occur during late May and may not be representative of the true peak in larval production for peacock, at least not in every year. Yes. And do you think this affects your results? Um, and conclusions. And the short answer is, of course, it's a concern. And yes, it very likely could be affecting the results. Um, so uh, the preliminary answer is, though, with uh, Lauren Rogers, who's drilling into this more and getting better at accounting for survey design and aging. And as you know, some of the work that she's collaborating with, with you on that. But her first stab at it, her predictions based on assumed mortality rates and some corrections of survey design was that her phenologies that she was getting at least for the Gulf of Alaska were a day different than the one that we had. So it seems that um, we're close when we kind of take these sort of global cross year averages of phenology. The bigger challenge is and what we didn't do in the study is to have an annual kind of floating phenology and allow the fish to spawn, you know, every year have a different spawn date, which very likely could be happening. And unfortunately, we just don't have those types of data for the same reasons you point out with, a, you know, these surveys were designed for pollock larvae, but in addition to that, pollock larvae are just much more ubiquitous. They have a longer protracted spawning season and um, there's a lot more data to work with. So, yeah. So, but there was some encouraging signs with a more, um, you know, refined look at try, sort of defining the phonology of spawn time. Um, so, oh, we got a question from Michael Banks um, that asked, uh, please comment on the assessment of the migratory shift as acting as a reserve given the loss of habitat in the two regions of your study. Is there a better survival estimate? Let me try to understand that. Please kind of assessment of migratory shifts is acting as a reserve given loss of habitat in the two regions you studied. Um, I, I mean, if it's I could kind of comment, I'll try to at least if I understand your question, right, Michael? Um, if you're talk, talking about um, the pointing to what we observed with some of the distributional shifts in the slide I presented earlier, where we do see, you know, um, changes in some of these summer feeding migrations. Um, and, you know, on a, on a first assessment, you know, as far as, you know, it's kind of hard to kind of couple the outputs that we have that are springtime larval with kind of overlapping with adult migration summer. But there is this sort of 
sense or at least overlap in the Gulf of Alaska, what we show in these models that Mary presented was that indeed, you know, the western part of the Gulf is looking a little healthier and maintaining a higher habitat suitability. And there does seem to be, um, I didn't present the data, but some young of the year recruits uh, are in higher abundance there. Um, the, um, and yeah, some, some evidence of some of the um, fishing activity being a little stronger and um, towards the west. So there's some suggestions that way. And in the north, as we see these summer bright feeding migrations go north in the Bering, um, you know, we very show that those, those areas in the Bering seem to be a little bit north, in the northern part of our study area of the Bering were a little indeed higher quality for larval fish. But again, that's sort of two different life stages um, and our two different sampling periods too. It'd be nice to have spawning habitat um, that are mapped out for both those regions to compare. As a long-winded answer. Um, so we have another question coming in from Will. Um, he's interested to know if you're planning to incorporate larvae or juvenile PCOD otolith data to ground tooth the experimental and model temperature effects on both growth and survival. Um, so I'll field that one again, I guess. Um, <laughs> um, <It's> not easy. <laughs> uh, yes, and so. Um, so uh, and Jessica Miller, who just asked the first question, we have a project together with MPRD um, to do and, and use otoliths to, to do age of growth work on specifically focused on the juvenile stages and kind of back calculate, try to recreate their, their growth histories from otoliths. And also a part of that project has a larval component in it as well. It's all focused on the Gulf of Alaska, but to answer your question is yes. So ongoing work. <laughs> yeah, exciting. Go ahead, Mary. And I was just going to say it's really exciting seeing all these different different uh, pieces of research coming together. So. Yeah, there was a lot there um, for sure. And uh, so I, we're waiting just to make sure that there's no more questions. I'm just curious, um, specifically uh, here at Hatfield, what would be the next step? What is your as this is kind of wrapping up, what is the future projects um, that you are both looking forward to um, taking this to the next step? And I'm gonna hand it to Mary since Ben's yeah. been doing all the questions. Yeah. Well, what we've been trying to do and, and trying to work with Ben on, I'm trying to get some uh, fish in the lab and particularly uh, Pacific hake to try to do some of these similar types of experiments with West Coast species. Um, but so far we've been having um, trouble trying to get uh, at least collecting hake from the field and getting it into the lab. But I think we're going to continue to try to pursue this, um, if not with hake, with some other species on the, on the West Coast in the future. Yeah, it seems like much of the work that you've done is transferable um, to our local species. So that's great. Um, yep. We're getting lots of thank yous and awesome and nice work and thanks for sharing. Um, and uh, we'll buy you a drink uh, in the future <laughs> when we can all be together. Um, let's see, there looks like there might be one more question before I wrap up here. Ooh, the challenging question. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is an issue that we're well aware of. Um, yep. <laughs> yes, we do you are. Want, do you want to go with it, Mary, or do you want me to take it? Uh, you could go, go on and take it. <laughs> Ben, will you uh, just kind of frame the question for those that might be online and are unable to see chat? Right. So it's, it's a great question. It's, it's a, um, so basically it's, the question is that, um, you know, what we're characterizing uh, phytoplankton dynamics just from the surface expression of the, of chlorophyll A, the, you know, to characterize the bloom. And we know that the satellites don't reach far enough into the water to really know the true biomass um, and uh, subsurface conditions. So there could be lots of activ activity and productivity that we're not seeing. And so does the surface expression really um, characterize phytoplankton blooms? And um, coupled with that, and rightly pointing out, the stratification is also changing, which govern the, the amount of um, chlorophyll A visible relative to subsurface. These are really important. And so I guess the only answer we have for that is that 
um, one, these are models and we're trying to stand up, you know, standardize metrics and have uh, standard metrics that we can apply across years to look at directionality and relative changes at the start. And of course, what we'd like to do is to know if these surface expression metrics that we have indeed correlate well or do characterize enough um, true chlorophyll biomass. And that requires more field validation. And so we conclude, and this is a point we bring in the paper, is you know, we're really careful to say that we're not um, characterizing true phytoplankton biomass in the system, but um, universal sort of tools to apply across years are useful and that we can all, always fill these things in with um, validation later. So I don't have a better answer for this, but I feel comfortable at least that we have good ocean color people with us on this paper to help guide mm -hmm. through that and how to, how to best interpret the satellite data that we have. So Mary, did you want to say anything to that? Yeah, that sounds great. Um, and also it, it you know, somewhat related was the point brought up about um, uh, with these, with the phytoplankton, the larval cod are not consuming phytoplankton. And so there's going to be a lag also in terms of, um, you know, the zooplankton production following the zooplankton, uh, the phytoplankton production as the cod are eating the zooplankton. And so we, you know, added some time on there to the mass, mitch, mass match, mismatch to, to account for that lag in production of zooplankton. Um, and we can do some sensitivity analyses around that just to, to make sure that the patterns are holding up regardless of that, um, regardless of the lag that we sort of we, we we're choosing. So just an, an add on to that piece too. It's something we've been thinking about a lot. Great. Thank you so much, both of you for sharing. Um, for anybody who's online that has additional questions and really wants to dig in and provide some um, feedback for Ben or Mary, um, go ahead and reach out to them directly. And uh, for everyone else, uh, thank you so much for joining us and um, hope to see you again in the future. Um, and if you want to share this recording, remember you can get it on the Hatfield's um, past seminar page. And to our presenters, once again, thank you so much for sharing with us today um, and being a part of this virtual format. I sure appreciate your time and energy and um, knowledge on this particular subject. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.